count on it. Uh, but feel free to do it later today if you feel like you have the time. But my expectations are really simple. Just kind of appreciate what's going on with EKGs. Uh, a little bit about how they work. It's actually some fairly complicated physics that lets this machine work. But let's back it up and just go over basic anatomy just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, I really like, this is a normal, you guys have probably seen this picture. This is from your textbook. They do decent illustrations of cardiovascular system, but what we will see in a second is really showing where the depolarization is happening that's causing these changes in this EKG strip, basically. But you guys are all familiar with the SA node stands for sinoatrial. You guys know what the atrium is already, right? You guys have gone over basic anatomy. There's four chambers in our heart. Probably didn't go over a structure called the sinus venosus because they don't talk about it in human anatomy at all, but that's where the sino part comes in. The superior and inferior vena cava actually come together. And so between my hands, but behind the atrium, there's a, uh, an area where the blood's waiting to kind of come into the atrium. That's called the sinus venosus. And then there's the muscular component that's the atrium. This node, this area of very, very strongly depolarizing cardiac muscle is right at that border between the sinus venosus and the atrium. And so that's where it gets its name. And so if you look at the models, you'll see like a little ridge right where the SA node is. And that ridge is actually outside of that ridge is where you're actually in the sinus venosus, but inside you're in the atrium. So again, SA node, sinoatrial, that'll help you remember where it is. The other node's the AV node, atrioventricular. It's at the border between the atrium and the ventricle. And so just remember, even though they show these in yellow, these are not nerves. There isn't nervous tissue in here at all. And so these are actually just areas of extremely conductive cardiac muscle. So the really cool thing about cardiac muscle is it's automatic. It's auto. It actually will generate its own active potential without innervation. It just constantly is doing it. But it can be acted on by your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system to be able to alter that rate. But this thing will just beat, you know, pull it out, no problem, it's going to beat. Don't need any innervation, keeps beating on its own. And so, where, what you have in these yellow areas is actually a way to, when the SA node fires, it's going to actually move out, and you'll see this in a second, it's going to depolarize both atria. But then there's an insulated skeleton, so to speak, that is between the atria and the ventricle, and it stops the depolarization from going into the ventricle. The only place that the depolarization can actually travel to, through is that AV node. So it forces the electrical signal to go through the AV node. And then there's an insulative area right through what's called the interventricular septum here that carries this all the way down to the apex, and then the depolarization starts. And so we'll see this again in the next pictures, but that is, again, it's just specialized cardiac muscle in there that is extremely either insulated or depolarizes really, really, really strongly, yeah. So you're saying that the only place where the depolarization is happening is at the V? For Kenji? Yeah. What I'm saying, and you'll see this in a second, is that you don't, you actually begin the depolarization. The first depolarization event happens near the apex. Is it because the entire thing is just myelinated all the way through? It's not myelinated, it's just wrapped in a bunch of connective tissue, and so it doesn't conduct. So. Basically, it's just like insulation around a wire, but the wire is not a nerve. The wire is actually just cardiac muscle. And since they have those gap junctions in all cardiac muscle cells, they're in the intercalated discs, that's what you're seeing, it acts like a wire. It conducts. If you make this positively charged, it's going to travel all the way down here. But you want the contraction to begin at the end. Well, the apex of the heart right down here. The base is up here. The apex is down here. You want it to start here because you want the blood to go up. You don't want to blow up the bottom of the heart and squeeze it down towards the end with no opening. You want to go from the bottom up. So you can't start the depolarization at the top. That wouldn't work very well. And so let's take a look at this a little bit more. This walks through each step. You're going to get firing into the SA node. That's your master pacemaker. There's those fancy arrows. That represents the depolarization, the wave of depolarization moving a little bit top to bottom, but also left to right. And so what these electrodes, everyone's seen the EKG electrodes that are on the previous pictures, you stick them on your body, and to do it perfectly correctly, you put them in specific areas that let you 
really measure each component of the direction. So one that's going to be on this side, one electrode over there, one electrode here. These two electrodes are just for once the SA node fires, they're going to sense that there's a positive charge moving this direction, or a change in charge, really, is all they're saying. So for every second, at first, this one's going to, this one on, this, there's an electrode here and an electrode here, this one's going to sense it first, and then a couple seconds later it'll be sensed here, and then as it moves across, that time delay will change, and that's actually what gives you those curves. It's just sensing the change in depolarization that happens. And again, one, the only way you get from the atria, if you're, if you're a negative or positive charge, the only way you get from the atria into the ventricle is through the AV node. And then the AV node is going to keep that depolarization within the atrioventricular bundle, or the bundle of hits, is what it's called. And then it's going to hit the apex, go along, to, along the Purkinje fibers, which innervate beginning at the apex and moving around the exterior walls. And so that's when you're going to get significant depolarization of the ventricle, hopefully pumping your blood really nicely. So you guys know the, the backup pace major is the AV node. I think you guys talk about that. It's got a slower pace. So if something happens to this and this one gets knocked out, that one will take over. And a pacemaker is just the alpha dog of all the cardiac cells. It's just the one that depolarizes the strongest so that when it says depolarize, Depolarize. It's go. Everything else is going to follow. And so, if there's one term on your sheet: fibrillation. Most people have heard or maybe have atrial fibrillation. And fibrillation is when you don't have a leader. It is when you don't have your pacemaker kicking in. And what happens instead of that nice wave of depolarization making the atria contract together, you get this jello wobbling going on because some they're just randomly contracting. And so you get almost no functional contraction out of the atria. There's also ventricular fibrillation, but you don't hear about it as much because if you have it, you're probably going to die real quickly. Uh, any significant fibrillation of the ventricle, you're out. You're going to be gone. And however long you can live without blood flow, uh, you will be. You, that's how long you'll have if you have that condition. Atrial fib is fairly common. A lot of people in this room will have it eventually. Uh, men are more likely to get it. It's not so bad, like most, probably like most 90 year old people walking around have it, but it's not that big of a deal because the atria are not the ones generating pressure to pump your blood, really. They're just topping off. Like the blood passively flows into the ventricles, and then the atria contract to top off the heart, basically, and get every last bit of blood in there. So they only make up about 5% of an addition of blood. So basically, with atrial fib, you get lightheaded. It's like your. It's really, it's really just a lower cardiac output. That's it. And if you're 90, it's not that big of a deal. You're not relying on maximum cardiac output much, so it probably doesn't make much of a difference to you. The scary part, though, is if you go in and out of atrial fibrillation. Because if you do get this fibrillation, what will happen is the blood will actually move through the atrium slower. And around the edges, because it's not contract contracting, around the edges of the atrium, the blood will actually coagulate. And you'll see in, the, in your dissection how all these little ridges, they're really cool looking little ridges, in there in someone with prolonged atrial fibrillation, it'll be coagulated blood. It'll just stay there. And that's okay, actually, as long as it never gets loose. But if they come out of atrial fib and then get a massive contraction, the atrium's going to break it all loose and send it into circulation. So people with, this is why they'll put people on blood thinners with atrial fibrillation. Because if you do, like many people, bounce in and out of it, you do not want to be throwing coagulated blood into your circulatory system. And so you'll be on Coumadin or something like that. Yeah, sir. All right. So let's take a little bit different visual look. We're going to talk about all the same stuff. But this is a picture I actually like because I think it helps you look at not only depolarization, but with an EKG, you actually also measure repolarization. Because those electrodes are just measuring changes in charge. So if, if you're dead and you put the electrodes on there, there's nothing in your body that would cause one side of it to be more positively charged than another, to make you polar, basically. There's nothing that would do that. When you're alive, your brain has electrical activity, neurons have electrical activity, but no abdominal, pelvic, no thoracic organ, no, nothing up in this region or really anywhere has the significant amount of mass of tissue that's going to all depolarize at once. So in your body, if you 
ever put electrodes on it, the thing that's going to be causing fluctuations in your charge is your heart. And so you can just slap those electrodes on there and figure out how quickly this change is happening, when these changes are happening, and you can actually get some information about the function of the heart. Now, the EKG, this readout here, is not going to tell you anything about your stroke volume. It's not going to tell you anything about your cardiac output. It can't do that. It's not measuring fluid at all. It's simply measuring the electrical activity. So red, again, is depolarization. It's going to move down through the atria, and that's what's going to give you your P wave. So this is the first wave. It's going to go P, Q, R, S, T. So P wave, atrial depolarization. The next step is those atria here are going to contract. And notice that the contraction actually happens after the P wave. Because the electrical signal, that's the signal. And there's a delay there. It takes time for the cardiac muscle to actually get the signal, depolarize, and contract. So don't claim that atrial contraction happens at the P wave. Because it doesn't. Atrial contraction happens after the P so moving on here, now we see green for the first time. This is actually repolarization because you're going, you're depolarizing, but you got to repolarize. And in both events, as you're, change, as you're depolarizing, there's a change in charge. And then as you're repolarizing, there's a change in charge. And your atria do that right here. They do it at the same time that we're moving down the bundle branches and off to the propinity fibers. So you'll get a little bit of ventricular depolarization here, and that's this first deflection from Q to R. And then, from R to Q, you completely depolarize that ventricle, and at that point, you'll begin that contraction. And then you have a wave of ventricular repolarization that happens here and here. The ventricle is way more massive than the atria, and so that's why it gets a much, much higher, much, much larger curve, because what the height of this curve is, is strength or voltage sort of, strength of depolarization per unit time. And the, most, the strongest depolarization per second happens when you depolarize here and here, when you depolarize the ventricle. But then the repolarization is also pretty significant, enough to produce its own wave, and that's the T wave. So P wave is atrial depolarization. Ventricular depolarization is that entire Q, R, S, complex, the whole curve. You can call it the QRS wave, that's fine. Um, and then the repolarization of the ventricle actually produces its own curve too. So there's three separate curves. For what are actually four events, and this is the, the one tricky thing about this, there are four things going on here. Atrial depolarization and atrial repolarization. Ventricular depolarization and ventricular repolarization. But there are only three curves. And just notice and know that the repolarization event happens at the same time as the beginning of the depolarization of the ventricle, the atrial repolarization, and so it hides. There's no curve for atrial repolarization. It, in theory, is there. It's happening, right? This is actually happening, but you can't read it because the depolarization of the ventricle totally overwhelms it. And again, we're simply measuring charge differences, so an EKG cannot pick up the atrial repolarization, it can't at all, because it's totally washed out. This is so much louder, basically, in terms of its electrical strength. So those are the four things going on. Those are the three waves. That's pretty much it. These are useful because you can measure heart rate from them. You can measure all sorts of issues with the conductive system of the heart. For instance, if someone had you know, atrial fibrillation, right? If you had no, if your pacemaker wasn't working, this P wave is not going to be clean. It may not even be there. In reality, you're probably going to get some noise, like a bunch of bouncing right before the QRS. But you're not actually going to see much of a P wave. You also might see two P waves. And if there's two P waves, that means to get your AV node to go, it's taking basically twice as much stimulation. If, you, if it's two P waves, then ventricular contraction. Two P waves, then ventricular contraction. That's because when this first wave of depolarization hits the AV node, it actually doesn't depolarize it enough. And that's usually from some kind of tissue damage near the AV node. And so anytime you damage tissue, two things can happen. One, if the tissue becomes less conductive, is that when, a, when something hits it, it doesn't travel through as fast or as well. And then the other thing is sometimes, if you do enough damage, the, the cell will actually simply depolarize. It won't contract anymore but it'll start becoming its own pacemaker, and that's not a good thing either. You do not want a third or fourth or fifth or sixth pacemaker 
in your heart, because then you're going to get crazy contractions and crazy electrical activity. Um, there were, a friend of mine had really bad atrial fibrillation, had multiple surgeries to try and fix it, and the last time they went in, they actually found that it was an area of his sinus venosus that, that was becoming a pacemaker. So it's a vein that's actually generating its own action potential and screwing up the SA node. And so it can happen all over the place, uh, apparently. And that's it really for this topic here. There's a couple terms. I already mentioned fibrillation. Bradycardia and tachycardia. You guys talked about that. Bradycardia is slow heart rate. So if you did not have your SA node and you only had your AV node fire, firing, you would have a slower heartbeat, so you would have bradycardia. And then if you were really excited or anything with a higher heart rate, that's going to be considered tachycardia. So those are just terms that are associated specifically with cardiovascular physiology that you're going to hear or read. Tachy means fast, and brady means slow. And fibrillation, again, is just uncoordinated contraction. Yeah. So Greg, so the, when that is depolarizing, the blood is just going in, flowing in at the same time as that's happening, mm -hmm. and then once it's polarized, it's all whole, and then while the other one's depolarizing, the blood is filling in the ventricle, and that, so that polarization is just for the contraction, it's just doing it so the muscle will contract and squeeze it. It's squeeze just it the out. signal. But so the like, blood is just doing its thing as that's happening? Blood can vary. You can't say for certain what blood is doing here. So, for instance, if you had like a narrowing of, the, of both beta cave and blood was just barely trickling in, well, you may not even fill up the atrium. That may not okay, even so that's just, it's kind of a side thing. It is. It, so yeah, this is just dealing the with... The heart could be empty. This is just dealing with polarizations and contractions. Yep, that, it's really limiting to that. It's just These are just the electrical signals that okay. are being sent through the heart to get it to contract. It doesn't but say anything about volume. normal heartbeat, that would be filling as it's depolarizing. Yep. Then it opens and that yep, The atria actually pretty much just fill all the time. They're constantly, they constantly have a line waiting to get into them, basically. They don't have valves. There's no valves between the atrium and the sinus venosus okay. or vena cava. There's no valves. So, so it's just waiting, just like a train. Hopefully it's waiting, yeah. Hopefully there's plenty of blood there and there's okay. plenty, a little bit of pressure to help fill. Um, and so normally the atria are going to be nice and full for you. But yeah, it doesn't say anything about how much volume's in there, whether or not it's actually filling, but in a normal heart, yes. You would always have the atria nice and full. All right. A couple other pictures in here. Here's the bradycardia and tachycardia picture. Right, so they're gonna, you're going to get potentially the same type of waves, but they can come in different frequencies. So it's a real convenient way to measure how fast your heart rate is. So you can do you can measure heart rate by pulse determination, as we'll do next week, or you can measure heart rate based on electrical activity. But you can't measure blood pressure this way. Right? You have no idea. It's nothing to do with the, the true fluid. It's not giving you any properties there. It's just saying, oh, you must be depolarizing the ventricle because I see those huge QRS waves. <laughs> However many of those pass per second or per minute is going to be your heart rate. That's in the fibrillation. There's one example. There, it isn't like fibrillation always works the same. Basically, it's just totally uncoordinated. You can't figure out what the P wave is, what the P wave is, because there really isn't. And there's some nice pictures in here just about the general blood flow of the heart, um, which you guys can review on your own. And you'll actually, you'll be thinking about this a lot when you do your dissection. Because with your dissection, you're going to need to know kind of in general how the heart is designed. So we already established there's four chambers, but there are also five major vessels that go in and out of the heart. Really, you can just talk about them as being really four, because I like to group the superior and inferior vena cava together as the vena cava. That's in my mind, it's easier just to have one input to the right atrium, and then the one output to the right, um, to one thing coming out of the right ventricle is simply the pulmonary trunk. And it might seem kind of random why I'm pointing this out now, but the reason I'm pointing it out now is you need to have kind of this basic map, what goes in to each ventricle, we were just going over the right ventricle and what goes out, because you're going to need to be able to pick out the blood vessels that are on the heart, and you're not going to just be able to have photographic memory and just know, oh, that looks just like the pulmonary trunk. What you're going to do is rationalize 
okay, here is a vessel. It's very thick because it's full of high pr pressure blood. And what does it connect to? And you're going to stick a probe down, and if it comes out in the right ventricle, then you know it's the pulmonary trunk. If it were to have come out in the left ventricle, then you would have known it's the aorta because the aorta is the only thick vessel that empties directly into the left, left ventricle. And so that kind of reasoning is really important when you're trying to make your decisions. Don't try to just know the qualitative features of each trunk or, or each vein. It won't work quite as well. Um, so that's it for this. Uh, what I'm going to want, I think we should just get the dissection out of the way and I'll walk around and kind of help you guys work through it. We'll run off of a picture real quick. I've got a video dissection on the website as well. So feel free to check that out. It was done here with pretty much the exact same line, so it should be pretty useful. Here's the video right here. There's some pictures that are actually from the data. There's a lot of this one particular model, so those pictures are there. I think we only have one of these, so these ones won't be quite as useful to you. Uh, this one might be. It's a nice one. But here's the one that's really a pretty nice picture that lets you see kind of what you're going to be looking at right now. So let's go ahead and grab hearts uh, in groups of four, and they're already cut for you. They look just like this. And so you won't need a scalpel at all. You'll just need gloves and a tray and some blunt probes so that you can stick them through the vessels. 